All right, welcome. Uh, this is the uh, Finance Committee meeting, Tuesday, May the 12th, 2020, at 7 o'clock. Uh, everybody have a copy of the agenda that was emailed out? Um, I think it was yesterday. Yeah. So just go over quickly, uh, just run through. Um, reserve fund stands at 3,314. Public forum temporarily suspended COVID-19 limitations. For new business tonight, we'll have a uh, board of selectmen uh, follow up from our joint meeting last week. Um, Whitman Hanson budget a slash assessment. A liaison budget feedback to department managers. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, uh, media outreach is another new business item and uh, firefighter response uh, to the letter that was sent. That's also new business under old business. Subcommittee reports, uh, the uh, Capital Committee and the um, Regional Agreement Amendment Committee, uh, which has not met, so, so there wouldn't be much to update there. Uh, under old business as well, we still have the uh, review article two, start voting recommendations. We also have uh, some updates to the um, revenue uh, summary and uh, the warrant uh, spreadsheet so there's some changes to that so as far as meetings coming up we, i just posted tonight for next week that'll be may 19th and then we have may 26th the placeholder for the annual town meeting is still set for june 3rd lisa has any updates been made to resetting the date for town meeting that you are aware of uh, not that I'm aware of. It's still, as far as I know, scheduled for um, the uh, 23rd. Um, Frank was going up to the high school Friday to look at the gymnasium for setup rather than the auditorium, um, but no further changes. Okay. Thank uh, you. 20, 22nd is the date, right? Monday, June 22nd? Yeah, that's correct. I'm sorry. Yeah, yep, yeah. The, the 22nd. All right, so I'll make that change uh, on the um, agenda for our next meeting, 622. Okay, so uh, we'll start off with the uh, uh, Board of Selectmen follow-up from our joint meeting. So um, as expected, there was, you know, quite a lot of lively debate. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to give a... Uh, and up to John, maybe it would be a good idea if you could just, because I didn't watch the rest of the meeting after the finance committee uh, adjourned their portion of the meeting, the meeting continued, you were there recording. Um, so maybe you could just give us uh, what you were uh, made aware of that happened after the finance committee left the meeting. Um, I mean, the, the only thing really that um, is pertinent to the discussion that we had was uh, they had follow-up discussions on the um, negotiations, I guess is the best way to put it, uh, with Hanson. Um, they discussed the possibility of changing their vote that they made while we were present, uh, but they decided not to. Um, there was actually a couple rescind motions, um, but it did not, they did not follow through. They ended up um, recalling that motion. And basically, I don't even know if they made a formal vote. I think they did. But basically, they just said that um, uh, if Hansen were to come forward with a proposal, that they would uh, receive it and present it to the board. And that was basically what they agreed to. Um, and like I said, I'm not sure if it was a formal vote or not. But OK. Welcome, Frank. Welcome, Ralph. So, Frank, can you uh, give us any updates from any um, negotiations that have come out of the town of Hanson? Right now, we're uh, updating from our uh, joint meeting from last week. So, nothing has changed. Okay. There, to my, uh, I'm not aware of any negotiations that have occurred. Okay, thank you. All right, does anybody else have anything they wanted to add to the Rosemary? Thank you. I just wanted to <clears throat> address a couple of um, things that were said um, about the split. We both have less than 
um, 1,800 children. So I, I don't see the state allowing a split, even if we chose to. Um, it's in the it's in the audit I sent Frank. They don't allow for you know there's a, there's a calculation on at what point you start to lose money and that you know it's not effective. So neither town has enough children to split. So I, I really hope that people begin to take that whole dialogue off the table. It's not, it's not real. Um, also, I, I don't, from my understanding, that there's no deal that can be made. It has to be made with the agreement that anything outside of that wouldn't be legal and allowed. That means we can't cut a check to a half a million dollars to Hanson anyway. I don't think that's going to be allowed or legal. So all of this is... I don't understand why we're doing it. It seems like a waste of time and it's uh, getting people excited and giving, like we said, false hope. I think we should be dealing more straightforwardly and looking at a path forward that um, gets us to a place where we provide education that is equal to the education within the state um, for our children. I think that's where we have to take this conversation, not, you know, not in these sort of, these abstract places. What does it cost to provide children an education equal to other schools in the state? And um, hopefully we can begin to have those straightforward, honest conversations. Rosemary, were you talking we left about, off. Go ahead, Frank. Sorry. Were you talking about the um, report from Suzanne Bump that came out in 2017. Yes, yes. Ben, uh, I, spoke, I don't know. I spoke to the auditor. I spoke to the auditor, and he said that they they wouldn't allow anything under. When did that. you speak to the auditor? Uh, probably about four months ago. Okay, because I I have seen and heard nothing. Um, that they, I am like, assuming if you want. that. Excuse me. Can I finish? Yep. I have seen and heard nothing. I assume that if there's going to be any discussion, that that discussion would be predicated on the understanding that an agreement would have to be reached between the towns that is um, supported both by the school committee and by both towns. And all of that has to take place to vary from what exists today. So, uh, you know, I don't know, I, I, I really don't know how we will I'll send you with an agreement um, prior to our town meeting. I think we're talking about deregionalizing. I said both towns don't have enough children to support deregionalizing. No, I understood you saying that. I I don't know that that's a fact, but what I am saying is that nothing can be done without an agreement accepted by the school committee in both towns. So, so whatever happens, it's not likely to happen between now and January 20. Uh, okay, January so yeah, I'll, send point, you, Frank. I'll send you information, Frank, um, that supports what I'm saying. But, you know, and again, it's in the audit that I sent prior to, if you want to read that over. Okay, thank you. So uh, Frank, just a double back on the um, regional agreement. So um, yesterday we were made aware that um, a warrant article has been placed for a placeholder for a regional agreement, uh, amended a regional agreement. Do you think that, that the likelihood of that happening from now until June 23rd is realistic? Um, I doubt it. Um, the originally back in February, the board had indicated that uh, under Justin Evans' request that a placeholder be put on the uh, annual town meeting warrant. Since there didn't appear to be any progress, it didn't seem to me to be particularly important to have that there. Last week, um, last week, no, I'm not sure. No, it might have even been Monday. Um, the schools asked that there be a placeholder for the regional agreement, so it's there. Uh, I don't know that 
anything will come of that, but it's there because they requested it. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any anybody else further from uh, follow up uh, from the last uh, meeting with the board of selectmen last week? So we did just touch a little bit into our second new business item, which is really an old business item, the Whitman Hampton budget. So school committee is scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, uh, anybody want to chime in about uh, anything that's expected? I do know that uh, there is um, on the agenda on, on, on a line item for the feasibility study, right? Is that correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. So Frank, um, since we're in that particular mode, um, walk us through how we transition from a unanimous vote to take the money out of free cash and now are borrowing it with the Whitman Hanson Regional School District uh, running well, the show. I wouldn't categorize unanimous vote to take it out of free cash. That was a recommendation. Right. The recommendation was based on what appears on the warrant. It became pretty obvious to us over the last few weeks that there was going to be a significant uh, reduction in revenue this year. I suggested and uh, discussed with uh, a couple of people that one of the selectmen, as well as a member of your committee, that it didn't seem to make a lot of sense for us to put $850,000 uh, up out of free cash when we're looking at a half a million dollar reduction in revenue. Uh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what it says. The source can be amended. Uh, the amount can be amended down, of course, but uh, that can be changed at any time. Remember, Selectmen have not yet approved and signed this warrant. Right. So I guess my question was more to still a worksheet in my mind. Well, I agree totally. So, but our discussion when I was speaking about the unanimous vote was the unanimous vote was to recommend that we use available funds. So that's that's what I was referring and to. And the vote was taken a month before everything that's happening now started. Okay. So we're not in the same world we were in the day that vote was taken. Right. And that leads me to another. There are also a number of warrant articles that are being withdrawn. Um, so one of them is the telephone, right, which is a pretty significant, was a pretty significant amount. Um, Correct. Back when it was on the warrant. So so I guess the difficulty here is that the the it seems more than ever, and I know we're in a unique situation here, but this is such a moving target. It is so difficult for us to, to make recommendations on something that changes by the minute, not just by the day. So warrant articles that were on here last week are not on here, and warrant articles that weren't on here are on here. We're in almost to the middle of May, and you know, I mean, I, I, I understand it's it's a difficult situation, but I just want to kind of just a, say it's become very difficult for us to make recommendations with such a moving target. So is there, in your expectation, more changes uh, to be considered? I know we still have the recommendations of the, uh, uh, the Capitol Committee here to right. recommend before we can move forward with all of the capital articles so i mean, am not aware any loose ends that's all i'm not aware right now of any changes that anyone is contemplating um the telephone was removed at the request of the regional school district the um, article for overlap funding for the council on aging was removed by the director after we had a conversation about it um, last Friday. Um, John, can you put that document up? Uh, yeah, sure. I do have one question, though, for Frank. 
Frank, have you heard anything back from Mr. Uh, Tuffy up at the schools regarding, I know they're voting on it tomorrow, um, but has there been any details on what that might look like from a um, financial standpoint affecting our budget? Any plans See, on how to do it? It's a proposed uh, ban, bond anticipation note, um, Sorry, which can be paid over three years. The requirement to service that ban is to pay the interest only for three years. Uh, as I had mentioned when we last talked about this, I don't think it's a good idea to carry the $850,000 as a liability for three years. I think we need to recognize that expense and amortize it in each of the last three years so that the final payment is an 850,000 plus interest. It'll be 300 and some odd thousand plus whatever interest is remaining. But again, that's a decision that has to be made by the, uh, by the school. It has to be made each year. I was not looking for a ban. I was looking for a three year fixed note, but we don't have the authority to borrow for that, apparently. I'm not sure I agree with it, but what I'm told is because it is uh, a feasibility study for an MSBA project, the borrowing has to be done by the region. Now, I don't know how cash is different. If we had paid for it in free cash, the region would have had nothing to do with developing the source of money. So I don't really get that. And I did ask John for an explanation on that. And he did say um, he would raise that question. But in any event, if we do borrow, and if we borrow under the terms that are presented by our financial advisor, who happens to be the region's financial advisor, then we do so and make a conscious decision as to how to service that debt, either by paying each year and reducing the balance. As it rolls year after year. Each year you pay interest and you roll the ban. It's also not a fixed rate of interest. Um, the borrowing we just recently did was at 1.48%. The rate for this particular issue is going to be two and a half. Do you know what the total is for the lifetime of the? Well, note? Rick, it's not a fixed note. It's, a, oh, it's, not a fixed it's note. like a credit card. It's right. 850,000 plus interest. So it could go to 4% in year two. Sure. There will also be a reimbursement at some point by MSBA. So that'll pay for that would go straight towards paying that off, wouldn't it? Yes, provided we proceeded with the project. Correct, correct. And do they reimburse the interest that we pay on the note? They reimburse a portion of the, of the uh, money we spend on the uh, feasibility study. It has nothing to do with the financing. Can I ask a question at this point? Right, um, it had to do with the, the evening that Ernie Sandlin made the presentation. And I explicitly said, so the 38 to 44% reimbursement would be for the feasibility study, even if the project itself did not proceed. And I left that meeting believing that his answer was yes, that the reimbursement is not tied to actually proceeding with the project. That's not my understanding. Uh, but we can certainly clarify that. Uh, I believe in order to get reimbursed for the feasibility study, you actually have to do the project. So who do we ask to find the answer to the question? We can ask Tuffy to reach out to MSBA and get an answer for that. Frank, do you think this puts a more... Uh, things to do on the plate of the region, uh, just given the fact that we still have yet to get a budget for this particular uh, uh, fiscal year, 
and the fact that they're really involved with amending the regional agreement, this kind of gives them one more thing to do that, you know, I'm not saying that I don't have confidence in their ability to get it done, but I think one of the most important factors for me when we talked about this about and when Ernie was at the meeting was the fact that we are in the queue for MSPA. And if anything happens to us proceeding, we're going to lose the spot in line. So I, I know we talked a little bit about you know waiting or deferring and that's why we wanted to move forward and use available funds. I think just so make sure that we did that, that argument that argument could still be made. Mm -hmm. um, I you know I don't know how we take a five hundred plus thousand hit in revenue and continue to spend as if it didn't happen. Um, I know. And I have but to you say, know where I, I have to say that. The challenge in getting a building project approved is demonstrating the need and informing the public. Um, it's a much bigger job than go to a town meeting and getting an approval, as evidenced by every project we've ever done. Now, if we can't persuade a hundred and some odd voters who attend a town meeting to support a project, what chance do we have? to persuade the community at large. Getting approval at the town meeting should be the easiest part of this project. Okay, go ahead, Rosemary. <clears throat> uh, we're talking about the feasibility study, Correct. which is the first step to the to the project. And, and it's, uh, it's meant to inform, to have an understanding of the condition of the building. So I, I don't know how you even begin the process of informing before you do this. Um, so in addition, I just want to correct something. You said that the audit was done in 2012. No, it was 2000, late 2017 into 2018. I never said so. 2012. I said 2017. Okay. Um, that is the audit. Correct. Okay. So, John, do you want to throw the document up there so we can just have a quick look oh, at sorry. the rest of the... You're talking uh, about the, of all the... Um all the, the warrant, warrant articles? Spreadsheet okay. warrant articles, yeah. Yeah, hold on one second. Sorry. And I want to uh, bring this up, Mr. Chairman. I just want to, um, you know, kind of discuss, you know, your, your comment in which you said, you know, this is a very difficult thing to do uh, in terms of the moving parts for make uh, this committee making recommendations. You know, nothing, you know, with all due respect, nothing – except for the um, change in estimated revenues for next year has changed as compared to what things have been done in the past years. So, you know, for, for this committee not to be, you know, well-informed in regards to the Article 2 and, 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 and not be able to handle this quote-unquote difficult situation, you know, I find that, you know, I don't know. I, I I don't have a term for it, but but also you keep referencing that this committee can't move forward with recommending warrant articles without recommendations from the BFCC. This committee has been up uh, updated of the BFCC recommendations each week, and for this committee not to be able to act ind independently from another committee, you know, makes us uh, you know, I don't know. I, I, I can't think of a term for that either. It's just, you know, we need to act independently from another committee. We can't rely on, you know, we can rely on recommendations from another committee, which we've been getting, but you know, it, you know, if, if we're going to be ineffectual and not make recommendations, you know, you know, for a matter of fact, if we, these warrant articles haven't even been brought up for consideration. So we've discussed them generally. So I know I, I just find this, you know your your characterization of the difficulty difficult position that we're in right now as a mischaracterization. Okay, well, I certainly respect your opinion, uh, Dave. Uh, I, I think what I'm trying to do is work cohesively with the other departments. I don't think we need to work independently with the capital committee. I was my understanding that we were going to take the recommendations 
of the capital committee and then make the recommendations to town meeting. The capital committee is best poised to evaluate the capital items. Do you not agree in that your charge? I do agree, but you're, you're, you're characterizing our, our inability, you know, you're, you're saying that it's so difficult to get through this process. Not, I've been on this committee three years now. This process hasn't changed. It's, it, you know, we're based on the way we, the way capital projects are presented to the town as, a, as an on-demand type procedure. That, that's what makes it difficult. Yes, I agree with that, but nothing has changed in, in regards to the way we've done it in the past three years. So, you know, you, you, you know your characterization is of how difficult this is. I, I, I don't agree. Okay. All I'm saying is the warrant keeps changing. We get a warrant and we read the warrant and we make recommendations on all of the warrant articles. These warrant articles are changing by the day. That's all I'm saying, Dave. I'm not saying it's an insurmountable task, and I don't think we are, you know, capable of doing it. I'm simply saying that if the wheel stops moving, we can start making recommendations. That's all. Rick, what has, that's the point. The wheel never does stop moving based on the, the, what we have here. We just need to... I think I think you again the characterization of this being so difficult is 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 an exaggeration. Just okay, your point is well taken, Dave. There there have been changes. We have a Collins Capital report. The, um, there have been changes that we could, but we could still follow them, the same uh, the same recommendations from the Collins Center. But there have been some changes to how we do things. And then. But hopefully that we're, if we're using those recommendations, there's been some change. But I, I think I agree with Dave that we can still go forward if we don't have those recommendations. One of the things I'd like to point out, if you look at the sheet of um, color-coded um, in green, all of the capital items that uh, Dave's committee has approved, um, there are only three items remaining for the capital committee to uh, decide on. Those are in yellow. Um, and they're the fire, firehouse renovations and um, Conley's sidewalks and generators. So um, the last meeting, um, the capital committee got a lot done actually. So I think from that standpoint, they're in pretty good shape. The rest of the ones that aren't color coded are not up to the capital committee for recommendation. Um, so we could move through those as well. So, I mean, really at this point right now, there's only three articles that have not been have recommendations from the capital committee hey okay. rick rick dave or uh, john why are there so many changes well in, in regards to the bfcc committee um you know we've uh we've identified uh uh well for example we for the uh number can't see it. Uh, number line item forty-two, number twenty-eight. Um, the school committee identified that they don't have enough information to move forward with the what they wanted to do, so it was withdrawn. So, and that's a pretty that was a pretty significant withdrawal of a hundred and seventy thousand dollars. So, you know, as as we question these articles, some get withdrawn, some get added on to, and some we get new information on. But again, this this happens every year. Yeah, let's be clear. There's only a couple of changes. I hear about all these changes. There have been a number of articles removed. That happens all the time. That doesn't create work for you. That simply eliminates that process. Um, what has been added has been the um, request for the uh, regional agreement uh, to be possibly presented and acted upon at town meeting and uh, a source of revenue or funding has changed in the recommendation on an article, but that hasn't changed the article. It's been eight, it's been 850 for two months uh, since we met with uh, Jeff and Ernie and uh, subsequently identified the number as 850. Uh, which is what the school is recommending that we use. The other articles have been here. 
So I don't know, you know, what are all the changes that are causing concern and consternation? I guess I, I simply wanted to get all of the recommendations of the Capital Committee for capital articles done just so a dollar figure could then be added uh, to Article 2. So we, so we know where we stand, Frank. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, I, I, but I just, it sounds like we're in chaos. We're not. Okay. I, I, right. I, I wholly apologize for my misrepresentation of where we are. Well, I, I don't, point I don't as well it's a misrepresentation. I think it's an impression, and I get what you're saying. I'm not arguing that, that, it, um, that there have been recent changes and uh, – it, it it's very difficult to work in the environment we're working in right now. Um, I am challenged to even get through a day showing some productivity the way things have been going, but we're making the best of it. We're looking at the analysis. Um, I am going to actually go for a walk if somebody comes to me and says, we have to change another revenue estimate because it's driving me crazy right now. Sure. I understand. Sorry, Frank. Sorry to drive you crazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's something we have to do. We, we're living in a world where things are changing. And my concern is we've identified a date for the meeting and hopefully we'll be able to do that. It's June 22nd. Um, we, I thought we had a location for the meeting. As of uh, Friday, it was going to be the uh, Performing Arts Center. As of today, the moderator is concerned that the Performing Arts Center may not be adequate. So now we're looking at moving it to the gymnasium, which is going to put a few more things in play. But it still doesn't affect our need to look at and act on the requests so that wherever we meet, we will be able to present a budget document that people can look at and review before they get there and have an opportunity to go through it. Okay. And mindful of the fact that the meeting is going to be June 22nd, we do have four more or five more finance committee meetings that we can use to make recommendations. So historically the warrant is done. The warrant is, is, complete when we start making recommendations. And like I said, if this is a complete uh, list of uh, warrant articles, then I would say that if the board is ready to move forward, we can start making recommendations on the warrant articles. I would suggest that we get a, a printed copy of the warrant, Frank. Could you provide that uh, now that it's in its Pretty much in its final form at this point? Yeah, there were three corrections made today uh, relating to uh, one had, one had a uh, different source of funding than was on the matrix. Um, trying to think of what the other two were. There were three that had that I think we I, I had mentioned. So you want me to email what I had out, Frank, what you had sent me this morning when I asked for it? Sure, because I those, can email it to him right now. That have been made. Oh, I don't have. I just when I asked you for it this morning and I emailed you what I had saw. I didn't have any changes to that because mine's a PDF. Okay, so well, that's so. I'll it, email it right now. All right. So I think if we have that, we have our meeting posted for next week. We should have no problem, uh, Dave. Your uh, committee is meeting this Thursday. Is that correct? I don't think so. No, we are not meeting this week. Uh, there was a lot of conflict, so we decided to postpone it to the following week. Now, to my recollection, there's only two articles that are up in the air on that. Am I right, Dave? Three. There's the um, the chief, the fire chief's request for capital work to be done in his uh, firehouse. Yep. And there's a question about. Um, compaction on road on sidewalks that need to be replaced in yep. the uh, elementary schools. So that that should not present a challenge. 
uh, to looking at this because in the worst of cases, everything that's there is approved and those are our numbers. If one or more of those come off, it changes what's available. Right. So articles 24, 25, and 26 are the, the only three that the Capital Committee has yet to make a recommendation on. Is that correct? correct. The, the correct. generator Conley Conley and Duval were the other ones, right? Right. And, and I'm not so sure we're going to have an answer on the generators between now and town meeting. I'd like to think it would. Okay. So is anybody on the com uh, committee not comfortable with moving forward for recommendations on the warrant as it's listed here? when we get a copy this week and we can do that next week. Sounds good. See no objection? I'm fine. Okay. All right. Uh, if anybody else, does, does anybody else need to look at this? Uh, John, you can probably take that down. Sure will. Thank you. So article two, we did start the process for making recommendations for the line items within article two, but Therein also we need to have some uh, significant uh, information. Uh, one of our biggest line items being the school budget. So um, we did start by questioning um, line items within article two. I would say we still have plenty of time for that process to go forward. So, you know, it's it certainly um, well within the time frame that we have review article two in in the file that i sent out yesterday um i had also done some color coding to the article two and the items in yellow are the ones that we had quest that we had voted to have questions on back a couple meetings ago um and then there's some that are in orange that we actually had approved but there were changes made to it after we approved them um, just about all of those line items came down in value. So I don't know if there's yeah. really much we need to discuss on those, but we did, um, you know, had voted them through at a different amount. Um, so the, the recommendations that we voted were previous to a vote of the Board of Selectmen that eliminated the COLAs uh, for this particular budget season. So I would suggest that we probably will reconsider what we have questioned. It doesn't take a lot of time to re-question the articles because there are some of them that will have to be changed. So I would say that, you know, given the time that we have, we can just, uh, unless someone has a objection, we could just reconsider the line items that were questioned initially. Rosemary, do you have a question? I, I just wonder how we can, um, Eliminate COLA for everything but one department. It doesn't reflect, you know, bargaining, honest bargaining. Um, All right, I, I need to address that. Um, mm -hmm. We have approached all of the uh, unions. There are five unions. The uh, when we began bargaining, the only union that stepped up was fire. As a consequence, we concluded bargaining with fire. We reached a, a tentative agreement. The, the, uh, the rank and file approved the tentative agreement. The selectmen approved the tentative agreement. So it now goes to town meeting approval vote. Uh, that's all been bargained. The other unions did not step forward to bargain. And in mid-March, uh, we reached out to each of the unions and said, if you're interested in bargaining, we would like to begin, but we want to be clear up front, we're not, um, we're not including COLAs in anything we're offering today. And they chose to just wait it out. So that doesn't mean it's not going to be bargained at some future date. And it is not at all unusual to have contracts bargained over a period of time that crosses fiscal years. In fact, it's, it's more common than unusual to not have all the contracts settled in the same fiscal year. This doesn't mean that if 
circumstances warrant it, we cannot meet with any of the other unions and say, okay, we're prepared to put X on the table, uh, or what are you looking for and we'll consider it. But it doesn't change the fact that right now the only union that has a tentative agreement is fire. And it would be up to town meeting either to approve it or to say, hey, wait a minute, we don't want to uh, put anybody in a separate class. Uh, and, they, and it doesn't get voted. That means we go back to the table with them. So that's, there's nothing I can do about that. That's the I think, I think my, um, my concern goes to the um, recommendations that Madden made. If we have five, one point, you know, the police uh, amount rolling forward to the two point, that that loss rolls forward too. So we're, we're sort of thrown off of those Madden recommendations. What recommendations did Madden make about bargaining? 2.5, not bargaining, the total amount of the budget. You brought it down to one point when you pull the colas. Um, it affects how we roll forward. And then how do we, next year, when we matter. have... It, okay. We have a contract that expires on June 30th. We have to negotiate a successor agreement. Whether we do it in May of 2020 or January of 2021, we are going to negotiate a new contract that starts on July 1st, 2020. And Madden never said people should be getting two and a half percent raises. He said the budget in total, the should budget not exceed two and a half percent. should cap at two and a half percent. And remember in that recommendation was a 5% for the schools. So yeah. do the math. If schools the, are going to five, the rest the, of the, the can't be going the schools up. Going, the schools total of 4.7, I believe, all education. Again, I'm talking about the recommendation because that's what you brought up. It, 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 it's not a it's not a a stone tablet that's been carved. It's a recommendation that we have to incorporate and work into our regular process. And the guides that he's provided us are helpful to get better fiscal management for the town. But it's not always going to be five percent. It's not always going to be two and a half. It may be less because we have less to work with. So Article 29, uh, Frank, that was a place set of capital. Now that is the um, uh, collective bargaining uh, amount, 59889 and that represents- Right, because we removed the capital article. It wasn't necessary. Right. So now that is the, the, the warrant article that would fund the cost of the collective bargaining agreement for the- That's fire. correct. All right. Um, Very good. Um, on the agenda next is the liaison budget feedback to the department manager. So uh, Chief Hamlin did send me an email yesterday and he was concerned that he wanted to get an update uh, based on what he saw in our last meeting. Uh, he felt that he would like to see an update on where uh, the police budget stands at this time. So perhaps it would be an idea for, and that's why I put it on the agenda, for liaisons perhaps to contact each department and give them an update to let them know where their budgets are in this particular cycle. I mean, we it's been quite a, quite a long time since we met uh, with the budget managers when initially we rolled out the modifications to um, all of the uh, budget budgets for each town department. So, um, you know, it, it's up to the committee if the committee feels the need to call and bring them into a meeting. It's a little onerous in this platform, I would think. But I think more or less what he's looking for is just an update. Uh, his budget was submitted um, months ago and just to give them an update on where it stands now, I don't think it would be a heavy lift. Does anybody have any other recommendation how we could get more information to these budget managers? Well, I'm meeting with all of the department 
managers on Thursday. And it is the same information that was provided in a similar meeting um, three weeks ago when the Board of Selectmen determined we were going to be offering no colas. So it should not be a surprise to anybody. So that information's already been given to each department head? It was given weeks ago. Yeah, okay. All right. So again, I'm, you know, I, I just put it on the uh, agenda for discussion. I mean, if there's some other um, option uh, that someone has any ideas of how to communicate back with the, the department heads is really what we're looking for, that's all. Um, moving on to uh, I, media. I, Go ahead, Rosemary. I would like to hear from department heads how these changes affect them or any changes or what, what you know, what they could, you know, what they, this, we're, we're budgeting for a whole different environment, a whole different world. Just a quick check-in before we have settled things might be smart. Um, you know, there may be additional costs in some departments and there may be, you know, departments like we've spoke, we spoke about last week that aren't even opening for the summer. So just a check in well, might be smart. With That's why we, uh, you know, assigned uh, finance committee members as liaisons to town departments. You're always encouraged to reach out to the okay. departments for which you are liaison. So if someone feels the need, I, certainly uh, I think more communication is better than less. That's all. I agree. Okay, so uh, media outreach. Um, Kathleen, I want to touch on this. This was a request for you to put on the uh, agenda. Yeah, I asked Rick to put this on the agenda because uh, at this stage of the game, and this ha it has to do with the um, information that has been spread through, we have the it's social media or the Whitman Hanson Express regarding the, the assessment issue, the school assessment issue. And I've heard nothing but pro Hansen um, rhetoric, both from Hansen officials themselves and apologists for Hansen. And the Whitman side of the story has never been told. And my, I, from my perspective, the Whitman side of the story is very simple. It's just the numbers. Um, it's the statutory method. It's the recent history of Chapter 70, and the what would have happened had the school committee. Uh, followed the statutory method, which they had, they should have known about. As uh, elected officials, they are, are responsible for learning their responsibilities and uh, they're managing a 40 to $50 million budget. They better have a better handle on how to handle that budget than what the recent history would lead us to believe they, they've learned. So we're in this mess because people did not pay attention to the numbers and it's not Hanson, um, it's not Whitman saying we can't afford uh, to pay our share, so we're going to ask Hansen to shift to a different method. This is the method that is used to calculate the budget, unless an affirmative vote has been taken to follow an alternative method. And that's never happened. So I would suggest to this committee that we discuss presenting an article, um, the chairperson of the Hanson Board of Selectmen was allowed the opportunity to be a guest columnist uh, a month or so ago and present her side of the Hanson, the Hanson side of the story. And I suggest that unless a different board in the town of Whitman wants to take it on, that the Finance Committee submit a request to the Whitman Hanson Express that we tell the Whitman side of the story, which is just by the numbers. I think that was used for an interview program uh, that didn't particularly represent the entire spectrum of opinions on this thing. But we, we've got this nasty rhetoric being thrown at Whitman and Whitman taxpayers not aware that they've been paying uh, a share of the budget that had it been calculated appropriately would have saved Whitman taxpayers $4.2 million. So Kathleen has offered to draft a, um, a letter and we could bring it back to this committee for approval if we want to put it under the heading of the finance committee. Does anybody want to chime in on Chuck? I just think it's a good idea. Yeah. Um, I, I have uh, shown some of the information. A lot of people I think in town aren't familiar with it. Some of my family, 
Uh, I've, I've shown them some of the information that Rosemary, Rick, and Kathleen, you guys got it. And, and some people can understand it a little bit, but it's still, it's, it's, it's complicated. Uh, I, I, I think it's a good idea to get it out there. Uh, third, that one, Kathleen. All right. So, Kathleen, if you I think want it's a great to, idea. Excellent. Thank you very much for uh, taking the lead on it. If you want to draft the, the letter, okay. maybe we could distribute it by email before the next meeting, and then we'll get a vote of the committee on uh, putting the heading of the Women Finance Committee on as a guest uh, writer. Okay. I, I have three-fourths of it already done, and I'm working on a concluding paragraph, and then I will sit it, send it to the, the uh, committee. I'll send it to you, Rick, and then you can distribute to the committee since sometimes my emails don't go through if I try to send it to everybody. Okay, anybody else on this agenda item? All right, thank you again, Kathleen, for taking the lead on that. We my appreciate pleasure. it. Um, our place setters are for subcommittee reports. The um, the building facilities and capital expenditure committee did not meet did you meet last week dave thursday yeah we did meet last week uh okay. we covered it earlier but all all but three warrant articles have been voted uh in the affirmative uh the regional telephone school district wide uh warrant of 180,000 uh has been withdrawn and that is it Okay, thank you. Frank, just back to that particular line. So should we be shifting some of the uh, other um, warrant articles for funding sources in order to best capture the levy with such a large amount now being taken off the table? I believe that article was intended to be out of free cash. So it will not affect the levy. Okay. Um, I think that this is a year where once we uh, complete town meeting, those last three articles are going to be very important to ensure that we retain some significant money in free cash and transfer some available money to capital stabilization because within a couple of months of that meeting, we're gonna be starting all over again. Uh, Dave's committee will be working on a new capital plan and this one will be, um, I suspect will be different than what you've seen to date because he's trying to model it on a successful plan that's being done in Bridgewater and a couple of other communities. And what I hope we'll see at some point is instead of having seven or eight capital articles, we'll have one capital article with a capital plan being part of that article. And the items will be listed with the costs, where they're coming from in the recommendation of the capital committee that this is our capital article. Um, we need to build that uh, with a conscious uh, understanding of what's available to work with. And I'm not so sure we're going to know the answer until well into the fiscal year, maybe not even until January or February. Um, we just, we're only guessing at what the impacts of all these things are going to be. And whatever we thought they were, I think they may be just a little bit higher because it's taking longer to come back. And, you know, this every two weeks, let's talk about coming back in two weeks is, is beginning to wear thin. And I think we have to genuinely question how much of this we're going to be able to reboot. Um, I don't think, uh, I guess for the first time, it's probably not a, a and a bad thing that we don't have a huge revenue flow in, uh, in, in meals tax, because I feel bad for the cities that are counting on those 
as a revenue in the coming year. I, I think you're going to see a dramatic change in that revenue, just like we're seeing changes in discretionary spending and the lottery, which contributes a significant amount of local aid. So uh, everything has to be crafted with clear understanding of what we have available once we've completed town meeting and um, what we're going to do going forward. I will say this, the, it is our plan to have a town meeting June 22nd. There are any number of possibilities that could affect our ability to do that. Um, a sudden upswing in, in uh, COVID cases could cause the state to put the brakes on gatherings. Um, this morning, I sent our town accountant uh, a bulletin, uh, it's bulletin 2020-6, which is the roadmap for creating a budget on a 112th basis, just in case things go haywire. I don't want to find out June 22nd that we can't meet and we don't have a plan for July 1st. So we'll be putting together the components of a 112th budget just in case. Um, it, it, it just makes sense to plan that. So I think on the one hand, we need to move ahead with what we know and what we have available to us, but we have to be cognizant that it's not always in our ability to control those changes. Thanks, Frank. John, do you have something? Um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, make a quick comment. Um, two things, actually, you know, um, we have to realize that this year we, we in the transitions that we've made with the ambulance fund, um, we have several one time sources of money that will not be here next year. Right. So we have to be very careful and we do. Um, and and the revenue hits that we that we took. Uh, Rick, you just mentioned something about moving things within the levy. Um, right now, our levy isn't even enough to fund Article 2. Um, we still have a $532,000 shortfall in the levy to fund Article 2 alone. Um, so we're taking that money currently it's planned to take from the ambulance fund just to fund Article 2. Everything else is being funded from one-time one sources, free cash or the ambulance fund. So... Uh, you know, I think we just got, we have to be careful as we look to move forward. And, and Frank said the capital stabilization, you know, the, this is one of the reasons going back to why it's better to borrow the 850 for the middle school instead of taking out a free cash, because we need that money. We need to keep that money available to us. And we have to be really careful moving forward. I don't want to start throwing up charts and everything. But um, remember, we got lucky this year that, you know, if we didn't have those one time sources, we would be in huge trouble right now with, um, you know, I, I saw an article this morning about Abington is scrambling because they've lost, you know, a lot of money in, in meals, taxes and other things. Um, so we just need to be careful on, on, on where we go forward and, um, and keep in mind what's going to happen next year. Point, point well taken, John. Yeah. Because, um, you know, like I said last week, we are we ha we haven't healed the budget crisis for two years. You know that's what we said. We that's why we hired a consultant to evaluate and give us a plan for sustainability. So you're right. Not for the one time money, we would still be in that situation today. So, so go ahead, Frank. You're mute. You're muted, Frank. I'm trying to hit the button. <laughs> One of the things that we need to keep in mind is we knew last year and we knew going into this year that this was going to be a get by year. We had formed a committee to study whether or not we should do an override. That committee recommended we complete 2021 and make our plans for going forward. Three years ago, I said we needed a levy increase to do capital. Two years ago, 
I said we needed a levy increase to do capital. Nothing's changed. We did increase the levy, but we increased the levy in part by taking uh, free cash out of the picture in part by using what was a captive revenue source that provided all of the capital for one department and, and made that part of our annual revenue piece. So unless we increase the levy, the net result is we're going to have less to work with. So part of what we plan for in 2022 has to be a levy increase. Or we're just going to be in the same boat. We're, you know, we'll be doing it again and again. Okay. Anybody else on that topic? All right. Very good. Thank I, you. I, I, I want, just on that, I, 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 Frank makes a great point about the levy increase, but with uh, a levy increase without reduced uh, reduced uh, budgets or redu without reductions. It's very difficult. So I, 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 I do appreciate it. Frank's absolutely right. He's been pounding this this uh, 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 issue for a while. Um, and, but again, uh, uh, with that, uh, by increasing the levy, fine. But without without some some concessions on on budget reductions, it's um, you know we'll be in that same we'll be in that same position very very soon after uh, if that if we end up going for an override we'll, we'll end up without budget reductions we'll have the do it again very soon what do you mean by budget reduction state um, specifically what do you mean by budget reductions eliminating services asking people to pay more money but no, at the same time about. eliminating services no there are budgets out there that can be reduced without reducing services and why aren't we reducing it now? Maybe we are. I don't know. I mean, I mean, the 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 the, the, the department had said last year that they were able to minimize any increases or not have any increases and have no effect to services. Maybe maybe that can happen again. I, I don't know. Not all budgets did that. The schools lost seventeen positions. I think they they did say that they had reduction in services when they did do those. I think police lost uh, had reductions for shifts, and so did fire. Was that correct? That when you I think you were very thoughtful. A reduction in, sorry, a reduction in shifts doesn't mean a reduction in services. Okay. Um, uh, when it comes public safety, uh, I'm no I'm not a public safety expert, but but I've I've learned a lot since I've been on this committee, and you know. You know, if, for example, if you wanted public, the best public safety, you'd have a cop in every corner. It, 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 that's, that's not feasible. So you determine what your risk is and, and you, you budget accordingly and you have, you have your shifts done accordingly. So having, having full shifts every single day and every single shift is not feasible and it's, and it's not practical based on a risk analysis. So... But there are budget, there are but line, line, there are line items out there that have historically not been spent to their their line to, to their budgets and had you know basically basically a, a give backs each each fiscal year, and uh, you know that that's that's something that we should and all those lines are ones that we have questioned for uh, our Article Two vote. So those okay. discussions I think will come up. So we can okay. have those discussions when we specifically talk about those uh, line items. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Communications. We do have one communication, uh, Frank. This is a memorandum you sent out on May uh, 8th regarding uh, conducting public meetings. Do you want to just quick, I could read it, but it's two pages long. So can you give a quick synopsis of that? Sure. Um, I, I found it necessary to do that after it uh, was brought to my attention that we were doing creative meeting without the public process. Um, the relief from the open meeting law was very specific. In it, the intent was to ensure that the public had an opportunity if not to sit in and speak at meetings, 
at least to see and hear what was being discussed. And it, it appeared that we were moving toward a process to um, not comply with that. So I wanted to make sure that every uh, board or committee that has public meetings understands the obligation to present our information publicly. That's the whole purpose of the memo, to say that uh, the statute that the, the governor's uh, uh, executive order that weakened, that's the word, that modified compliance with the public meeting law, the open meeting law, very specifically said, only under these conditions can you meet without broadcasting and presenting your information. And under those conditions, you need to have a transcript of your meeting and a recording of your meeting that are publicly available, presumably within a day of the meeting. And we are not in that position because of our arrangement with uh, Whitman Hanson Cable Access and our technological uh, availability. Every board and committee can meet publicly and provide that information publicly to people. So it, it, it became necessary to remind people that this is not a free pass on the open meeting law. We have to do everything above board. That was the purpose of that memo. So we are in compliance. With yes. The way, yes, that we're doing. Yes. Kathleen, go ahead. Does that mean that this meeting should be broadcast live? It is being broadcast live. No, it's not. No, the oh, finance okay. committee has not been being broadcast. As long as it's broadcast, it's going to go up on YouTube by tomorrow. By tonight. So it still meets those requirements. So the answer is no, it doesn't have to be broadcast live. Within our ability to do so, if the cable committee, if the cable access board can't broadcast every meeting live, then as soon as practical after that, it has to be made publicly available. And in our case, it'll be published on YouTube. I just assume these were going out live. Is there a reason why it's not going out live tonight, John? Uh, the, I mean, I mean, WHA is doing all they can to um, work with both towns to handle mm -hmm. all of their meetings. So they have limited employees that can handle uh, so many functions. So, um, you know, this is a meeting that has never gone out live before. In fact, it's never even been videoed before. Um, so, you know, we've always been, or this meeting, has never been gone out live even since we've been in the zoom format um tuesday is generally a a lot there's a lot of committee meetings going on right now between the two towns hansen and whitman so the ability to go out live it, it's not practical for every meeting that they can so generally it's the school committee it's the two board of selectmen's um and then dave's committee has been going out the building committee has been going out live in most cases because that's held on a Thursday night and there's not a whole lot of other meetings going on on a Thursday night. So that's kind of what it is. So, so who, who decides that this meeting is not being broadcast live? WHCA? Well, number one, it never ever has ever been broadcast live, number one. Um, it's within open meeting laws to do the way it's being done right now, which is I mean, the video's going, the video's up by 11 o'clock at night tonight. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, again, yes, WHA will make the determination, but generally, a, a meeting that's never gone out live, it, they wouldn't consider putting it out live unless it were specifically were requested to. Um, so, I mean, this is a meeting that never has ever been live. So, um, so I think the intent is to make sure that the public has access to the information as soon as practically possible. I did have a um, an email. I did send an email to Eric Dresser, uh, Whitman Cable, um, and I, I did share it with the committee just to say that you know this committee feels important. Uh, it's important enough for us to also share the video of the meeting as well because a lot of times we share documents 
Um, and that's something that uh, I feel strongly that the public should should be able to share those documents as well. So when boards and committees decide that they are going to broadcast their meetings audio only, then the public doesn't have the option of, of viewing those. And quite frankly, you know, having the opportunity to identify speakers with a video portion of the broadcast, I think gives them a better, um, you know, it, it makes it easier for them to follow. So um, again, I, I, I thank uh, Whitman here to Cable Access for the commitment to getting the information out as soon as they do. So does anybody else have any other questions on the memorandum or any part of that? Uh, just, just to not leave it there, I wanna be clear. Uh, if we're not doing it live, then we're required to get it out as soon as practical after the meeting. And we are doing that. We are doing that. We are yes. in compliance. Absolutely. Yep. I, I was just, I just assumed these were going out live. Okay. All right. Thank you. There are no other um, communications. Does anybody else have anything they would like to bring up on a new business? Or I, I just one thing, I do have one more agenda item after the media outreach was the um, firefighter response as uh, I did share the letter that was sent. Um, and, you know, we had a discussion um, the last meeting, was it? And, you know, comments were made that the uh, firefighters local took exception to some of the comments that were made. I did send an email basically uh, indicating that, uh, you know, uh, we take the matter very seriously and that we would follow up. So I think for the purpose of just a follow up um, with the board's approval, I'll just send a, um, a letter. I'll send a draft out to the committee. Yeah, that's fine, Rick. Anybody else on that? Yeah, I mean, is it you bring it up? I mean, it's a great country that we live in that allows free communication. And, you know, you know, the founding fathers thought, hey, this is the number one priority. It's free speech. And that's what allowed the fire department to, uh, to send that letter to us to show their dis dismay or, 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 or whatever toward discussions in this committee, you know. And, I, you know, I, I know the fire department doesn't hate this country, doesn't hate the Constitution. But if they're going to try to, so I, I, I can't see any other reason for that letter other than to try to potentially intimidate this com committee members here. So I, I, I implore every member on this committee not to, to always speak your mind and speak it clearly. That's all. Yeah, no, point well taken. I I would like to, I'd like to say something really quickly. Um, I don't, I don't think, it, I, I think it, what Chuck said was, was sort of out of context because there were larger conversations about keeping um, monies under control, finances under control, and that, you know, we should look in every direction um, to do so. But in, in, and my response was more in terms of, when we do that, we need to use uh, something similar to what the Collins, the original Collins report or the older Collins report did where we, we consider the cost of living, consider the impact when, we, when we're doing this as a, as a, we can't negotiate a contracts and finance committee, but um, as a town in general, that we should do it more strategically and less sweepingly. That's all. Thank you, Rosemary. Chuck, did you add anything you want to add? Um, well, since uh, since this committee member was the one that uh, was speaking, that uh, I think I think that it's easy for the words to be taken out of context for somebody just watching this one one meeting that we had. Uh, if anybody needs a little clarity, where my thought was, um, I thought the other committee member might be going down the road of. If we were saving money somewhere, we might redirect it to hazard type pay, something like that. And I'm just focused on the fact that uh, our public safety is very well supported already. They're doing a great job. And we have a lot of other needs that have we've been kicking and scratching for money the last few years. There's a lot of other departments that, uh, that need help too. So I thought uh, that was my thought process was 
We don't need to redirect any saved funds. And we just need to take care of everybody, the whole town. Okay. Thanks, Chuck. Uh, Frank, did you have something you want to uh, add? I just want to clarify one point. Uh, Massachusetts is um, a very um, committed state to um, equitable treatment and supportive unions to the point where Mass General Law Chapter 150E has a profound effect on how municipalities, how local governments bargain with their unions. Uh, there are two unions that are eligible or able to go to the Joint Labor Management Committee if we can't reach agreement. The other three unions in town cannot. They can bargain to impasse and then you're out of luck. So we're not on a level playing field. And anyone that thinks that we should pick and choose how we bargain with people has not lived the negotiating process of one foot. So I'm just going to leave it at that. We don't we don't say this is worth more, so we're giving you more. What we do say is we are going to attempt to determine the value of the services provided and to compensate those personnel accordingly. And it isn't always a balance. It isn't always equitable. But by and large, you will see the history of salary increases are very closely tied to the system of parity because the minute we differ from that, we end up arguing that point at the JMC. So it's not, it's not as simple as one might think that you walk in and say, okay, you work harder, we're going to give you more. We'll spend all our time in arbitration if we do that. That's right. It, it okay. seems my comments were taken out of context right there. Um, what I was saying is we were having one department having cost of um, recognized, and it's a simple cost of living, um, and others that were not, and that that weren't going to the table. And again, the process for that exists. Because that's the way the bargaining fell. We had no option to change the others. Hmm. Part of the part of it is the strategy of the union when they choose to. I mean, a fire uh, as a union that reached an agreement had not moved when they did, we would have had no contracts going forward with an increase right now. And we'd still be targeting all of them. We'd be at the table for all of them. Again, the Collins the Collins Center takes into all the cons the considerations of the uh the, absolutely the not laws. The center didn't address union bargaining and the parity piece. Cost of living is part of that, correct? All right. Well, we're moving just a little far away from that topic anyways. Um, I think we know, you know, to Dave's point, I think if there's a, you have an opinion on something, I don't think you should temper your comments based on who's may or may not be watching. I think that's a good point. Um, but like I said, it, I'm probably the one that's most likely to say something that uh, disturbs somebody. So having said that, I don't mind following up. I believe that we speak as a committee. If somebody you know, says something that offends somebody else, I think we just address it as a committee. If there's some praise, I think it should be shared for the, by the entire committee as well. So, so I don't have a problem responding to the concerns uh, that were raised through the letter. And I think it's pretty easy to move on to the next topic. So, and that uh, exhausts all of the items that are on the agenda. To, Kathleen, do you have something? I just have one quick question since we have Frank with us here tonight, and it has to do with the forensic audit that was put out to bid. And the question is, has that bid been awarded and is the forensic audit somewhere in the horizon that we'd have a finished copy? COVID-19 put a halt on that. Okay. Um, it, it's funny you mentioned that because I did call today to follow up on that and left a message 
with the Hanson Selectman's Office, but I have not received a call back yet uh, because I'm curious to know how and when we're going to proceed with that. I think it's an important part of understanding the entire process of budgeting at Whitman Hanson uh, and how funds are administered, but it, it has a time value too. And it's pretty obvious to me, it's not gonna happen before town meeting. So mm -hmm. we have to look at that and try and figure out um, how we move forward. I still think it's important we do that. Has the bin been awarded though, Frank? Has it? Um, yes, because we only had one responsive bidder. Okay. So it's gonna go back out to bid? No, it it it, it was it was awarded to the low responsive oh, bidder. Oh it did. Okay. Um, I have not signed anything yet. Uh, so we we do not yet have a actual contract. And and again, this all came right at the same time we were sending people home, shutting down offices. Right. So I suspect it would have been difficult to get an auditor to come in and sit with people. Well, I don't anticipate who in there to sit with right now. Yeah. <laughs> No, I didn't anticipate it would be of any help to us right now for the fiscal 21 school um, dilemma. But well, for the long term, January. <laughs> the long term understanding of how money is spent in the uh, school, it's a $55 million enterprise now. I think that for the school to have some credibility given the recent uh, revelations, a forensic audit is something that will help either reassure us or open our eyes to practices that need to be remedied. I agree. Okay, very good. Thank you all for participating. Um, we do have, uh, Scott again was absent, so hopefully he'll be with us next week. So we're at full strength to make recommendations on these warrant articles. So Frank, uh, just gonna email a copy of the warrant. You already have it. Very good. All right, does anybody have anything else? All right, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. We'll do a roll call vote. I'll make that motion. Okay, second a motion. Is. And we have a second. Okay. Uh, around the table. Dave? Yes. Al? Yes, sir. John? Yes. Kathleen? Yes. Ralph? Yes. Chuck? Yes. Rosemary? Yes. And I vote yes. Thank you all for participating. Look forward to getting started on the um, warrant next week. John, thank you for hosting. Thank you, yes, John. Thank you, John. Thank you. All right. Thank you, John. Thanks, Rick. Thanks. See you, everybody.